Neil, thank you very much and congratulations um, both on the outcome of this trial as well as your publication today in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and I, I should I should disclose that um, I wrote an editorial on your paper that I, I you mentioned you had seen earlier. I want to ask you, you know, there, this trial actually, I think, did two key things. And you can tell me if you agree or if you have other thoughts. One is, it, you know, certainly it had to play a role in demonstrating the ability of this new oral antagonist to do what it's supposed to do. So, so the, the primary endpoint, superiority and non-inferiority, you know, that that was a key thing and that's what you need to do to get such agents approved. But I think more importantly, <laughs> in some ways, is what, what the study showed about cardiovascular events. Um, what, what, what is your thinking on that? I mean, especially in terms of perhaps you think this could represent a new standard of care. So, so thank you, Tia. And, and by the way, I thought your editorial reviewing our trial, the HERO trial, as well as the data of the overall survival um, uh, data on the PROSPER trial and how you reviewed it, and you uh, really in, a, in an incredibly concise way uh, emphasize the importance of, of all um, healthcare uh, providers, whether they're radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, urologists who take care of, 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 of prostate cancer or, or cancer patients in general, that cardio oncology and cardiovascular complications in our at-risk patients, especially prostate cancer patients, is, is, is extremely important. And historically, we've, we've not paid the, the, the right amount of attention to it that we need to be doing currently. Um, and so I feel that uh, we've, we've been aware since the onset of, of some earlier studies, some retrospective studies in, um, um, in depo GNRH antagonist versus depo or parenteral LHRH agonist. In, in a nice paper by Albertson, it was a series of six retrospective trials or six trials that were retrospectively analyzed demonstrating a difference in cardiovascular events. A, a recent phase two uh, study by Margell and all showed in a, in a, a group of 80 patients comparing uh, a, a parental role uh, antag uh, GnRH antagonist to LHRH agonist that there was a dramatic difference in cardiovascular events. What's very pr uh, you know nice and I'm, I'm super proud for our, all the, the leadership of uh, my co-investigators and the study sponsor was that this prospective global study has now also uh, really showed with tremendous um, uh, 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 rigor to the trial uh, this difference in cardiovascular events. We we've, we have a lot of different theories as to why this occurs. Uh, it's potentially related to the um, elevation that you see in FSH levels uh, with agonist as opposed to antagonist, which may be related to uh, cardiac myocytes and uh, immunocytokines at, at the level of the coronary vessels. It, it's, but it, there are other issues that are involved as well, but nonetheless, our curves separate very early in this at-risk elderly population. If you look at the, the KM curve and that 54% reduction in the risk of a cardiovascular event, uh, and I think that this is uh, extremely compelling, and I think this is something that, you know, uh, both uh, patients and physicians are, are going to want to learn a lot more about. I, I agree, and I think that um, I, I like the fact that this trial just adds to that um, previous group of trials you mentioned that, that was still, you know, a large retrospective in the Albertson study, but the Margold prospective study was small. But now here we see in a prospective phase three study this, these great um, results. And so congratulations about that. I, I'm very um, optimistic about uh, the role for the antagonist. Now, I, the other thing I, I really was curious to ask you because um, you showed nicely in your presentation that T levels um, rebound very quickly after stopping relugolics. Now, that can be a very good thing, obviously, from the patient's perspective. But it can also mean that uh, the PSA may come up 
more quickly in it, you know, in such situations where that's going to happen, such as biochemical relapse, for example. Uh, do you have a sense for that? Well, you know, we took that subset of 184 patients who, who uh, these were patients who didn't have metastatic disease. They were, uh, for the most part, really biochemical relapse patients. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as you know, when you're treating someone with uh, four months, six months, or even a year of therapy, maybe it's for combination radiation therapy synergy, or perhaps it's for uh, intermittent at androgen deprivation therapy, patients really want to know, and appropriately so, when will they have their T recovery and when will they uh, start to feel stronger, less fatigued uh, and, get, and, and uh, resolve hot flushes or, or hot flashes. And so I can tell you with 184 patients, we saw 54% in the relagolix arm having been honored for 48 weeks, get to a ugonadal uh, T level uh, in 54%, whereas only 3% in the luprolide arm. So I, I think this is very important for certain subsets of patients who we deem are appropriate for shorter term therapy. You know, and then there's even possibilities of, you know, you start somebody on ADT and then some other thing may happen to them, like they break their hip, they're in, a, in an automobile accident uh, or something, and, you know, they'd like to be off of their T suppression for a period of time. And you can you can conjure up a lot of other scenarios where, uh, a, a parenteral depot formulation doesn't give you anywhere near that option. The other thing that's become glaringly clear is this, you know, pandemic of COVID. And now patients can have a, a, a once daily oral medication and don't have to undergo the concerns of coming into a clinic, subjecting them pot potentially in a high infectivity uh, rate area as well as even contaminating um, the healthcare team. So as we move more and more to oral oncolytics, I, I think this has an, an, an additional attractive um, option. And one, one final um, quick thought. Uh, you know, we know across medicine, there is a compliance problem with people staying on oral medications. I mean, obviously the study is only 48 weeks, so you, you don't, and, and you had very good compliance for both drugs um, across the board, but do you, do you think that that could be a problem or, I mean, do you have a sense? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, um, as I said, we're here in, in, in prostate cancer. Uh, when it comes to hormone sensitive metastatic disease, we're, we're in the world now where it's ADT plus, right? ADT plus enzalutamide, four capsules once a day, or ADT plus apalutamide, four pills once a day, or, or abiraterone, uh, you know, four pills once a day, non-fed state, uh, plus five milligram prednisone. So, uh, you, you know, we're, we're in that uh, understanding that uh, oral daily medications and compliance are, are very important. Uh, patient healthcare team education is essential. Of course, in a trial, there's great fidelity to uh, monitoring for the dosing schedule, uh, whether it's a parenteral or an oral. But we also know in the real world that many folks uh, sometimes have challenges uh, coming in uh, appropriately for their parenteral injection, and that could be on the patient side, it can be on the clinic, the clinic side. Um, there are, you know, uh, pharmacy data and ways of enhancing compliance I think there are examples of doing this throughout oral, all of oral oncologic care. And I, I, I don't think this will be a problem, especially for a one pill once a day that can be taken in a fed or non-fed state. Great, and I, I, I agree with you. I think though it will also be easy to tell if somebody isn't compliant because of the, uh, the, the, the rapid rise in T. <laughs> So well, that's a great point. And I, I would add too, this is important. I thank you. You just jogged my my memory here. Is you know, the half-life of, of Relagolix is, is 25 hours. So mm -hmm. um, you know, even if you, you know, because it's such a long half, you know, it's a relatively long half-life, you know, take, you know, you know, by any uh, biological uh, uh, or, uh, assessment about five half-lives to have the drug totally out of one system. 
So, you know, you'd have to you th think that even if you were delayed in taking a dose or might have missed one dose, I think we feel pretty confident that its impact is going to be uh, rather uh, consistent. And we do have some additional data that we're analyzing and plan to publish on that as well. We also are looking at a subset of patients we've kept on drug and monitoring them who had metastatic disease, and we'll be following them for the uh, um, the, the, their potential uh, progression to MCRPC, which we think may be very compelling as well. Great. Well, thank you, Neil. Um, we really look forward to seeing what kind of uh, results you find with that. That will be really interesting. But again, I want to congratulate you for taking for having this great study um, presentation earlier today and now with us um, on your New England Journal of Medicine article. and. Um, you know, you guys do great work there, and congratulations once again. means a lot of, uh, hearing that from you, Tia. Thank you very much. You're very welcome.